single divide. Or the same thing in the in the green is great if it's uh, light blue it's okay and here are the sites and these are the exposures so if you go for garlic garlic is preventive for colorectal cancer foods containing lycopene it's not lycopene pills food containing lyco lycopene it makes a big difference prostate cancer foods containing selenium prostate cancer red meat higher <laughs> risk of colorectal processed meat also higher risk of colorectal. Alcoholic drinks, liver, colorectal, breast, premenopausal, breast, postmenopausal. High birth weight, uh, increased risk of uh, breast for the postmenopausal. Overweight, a special category which is not an exposure, but there was so much data on overweight and obesity that there was a special column for weight, what defines high weight, and of course, High weight is energy dense foods, uh, salt and salty foods, and you have physical inactivity, <coughs> sedentary living. If you go here to arsenic in water, increases the risk of lung, increases the risk of, lung, of skin cancer, and uh, so some of the chemicals in water may also. So all of these are related to obesity. So in the green, when it decreases the risk, for example, for greater uh, lactation, women who lactate have less pre and post menopausal breast cancer. Uh, body fatness it decreases the risk of premenopausal breast cancer. It increases the risk of postmenopausal breast cancer. So the same exposure has a differential effect if it's premenopause or postmenopause. And these are the factors that define risk of obesity because obesity, as I said, was so prominent that there were also meta analysis on what defined risk of obesity. Uh, this is now this is now the other compounds increasing risk for the various cancers. And you can see here foods containing dietary fiber decrease the risk of colorectal cancer, aflatoxin increases the risk of liver cancer, non-starchy vegetables, so it's not any vegetables, it's mainly the green leafy vegetables increase the risk of stomach, esophagus, mouth, and pharynx. Fruits have also a beneficial effect on all the upper GI, upper GI uh, cancers. Garlic decreases colorectal cancer, and food containing lycopene and selenium decrease risk of prostate. And you see here, adult, this is all the obesity related. Sedentary living, physical inactivity, body fatness, abdominal fatness, adult weight gain, Attain height, greater birth weight. Lactation decreases the risk of uh, breast cancer. So weight has various manifestations. It's a distribution of the fat, it's a total fat. It is how early did you gain weight. This is to give you an example for body fatness and the breast and the increased risk. Increased risk of esophageal, pancreatic, colorectal, breast, endometrium, kidney, colorectal, Body fatness for gallbladder, abdominal fatness for pancreas, breast, and endometrium. So a whole range of cancers are increased by obesity, especially abdominal obesity. One third then are related to diet and physical activity. Excess salt, nitrates, and nitrates and nitrites increase the risk of cancer of the stomach. Increased energy energy imbalance, positive energy balance increases. Uh, colon, breast, prostate, and endometrium. Fruits decrease the risk of GI, lung, neck, uh, and oropharynx. Now this is data from Chile. We don't have a national registry, but we have regional registry. And this is more or less what it would look in most developing countries, prostate, stomach, uh, skin, lung, uh, for men, and women would have breast in Chile, uh, uh, gallbladder is very frequent, cervical uterine is still high despite the fact that we have a national screening program, stomach, ovary, colon, and you can see the list. Now if you go to a city in the north, this is cigarette smoking just to give you men and women, but if you go, then this is a coexistence of obesity and sedentary life. So this potentiate each other, but the this is the, the consider the the avoidable causes linked to tobacco, high blood pressure, and alcohol. What I'm trying to show you is this one. 
This is a very special pattern from the north of Chile. This is Antofagasta, close where the copper mine and the saltpeter, the nitrates that are actually extracted. Look at skin, lung, prostate, go, uh, uh, bladder, bladder and stomach. And this is for men and this is for women. So this is very suspicious about potential arsenic exposure. I'll give you a taste of the arsenic story. This is arsenic around the world, various places where arsenic is high in water. This is now the northern Chile, the driest desert in the world, and few water sources. And most people then consume water from established sources, so you can know exactly where the water came from. And that historic registry is there. Now, this is the, tra the tracing of the arsenic content of various sites in the north of Chile. And there was no guideline value until 58. And the guideline value came at 200 micrograms per liter. It has come down all the way to 10. So we have had, over the last 40 years, a chronic exposure to, ars to arsenic, despite having WHO guidelines, because the threshold of what constitutes a risk has been progressively coming down. This is a very important point because, as, as I will see, this is the exposure uh, that was measured across sites, and you're supposed to have one here, so 10 micrograms, and you can see here that the values in all of these areas exceeded. This is Antofagasta, and this is skin cancer rates. You see, Valparaiso, that has no arsenic, has about a third, and continues to have about a third. This is skin cancer. Adjust, age adjusted mortality in the north relative to a city like Valparaiso. This is now bladder cancer, and again, significantly increased uh, risk of bladder cancer. In this case, uh, compared to Valparaiso, and the same tr is also true for lung cancer. And this is quite interesting because this is the, this is the type of exposure, and this are the cancer rate. So there's a 10 to 20 year lag between the time of exposure and the peak of the, of the cancer. So you do not see it concomitantly. You need to study the, the long-term follow-up in men and women. This is lung cancer and this is bladder cancer. Again, a 20 year cycle. We were interested in seeing, as you see here, this is the exposure and this is the peak of the occurrence. The occurrence down here, this is the exposure. The exposure stopped, but the cancer rates went up 20 years later. One aspect of interest would be if children were more sensitive than adults. And this is the data that's already been published showing the cohorts, the, the time of exposure was fixed, but there were people being born at various times. And if you were born, if you were exposed as an infant under two years of age, your relative risk was 13 times the adult rate. If you were exposed as a child, two to five years of age, it was also 12 times, a young adult, eight times, middle-aged adult, four times. So this age sensitivity is quite relevant. There's an interaction with smoking. Smokers have significantly higher rates. I would also refer you to TRS 916. I chaired this meeting with Becca Pushka while he was at WHO. It makes for good reading about prevention of chronic disease. It's not only in English, it's in Spanish, in, in five languages. And this is for those of you who have not seen it, only to remind us that obesity was considered a disease only in 1997, before it was only a steady condition. There's also material in cancer. The main recommendations, you already know them, modify the quality of the fat, moderate saturated fat, sodium and salt, <coughs> Refined carbohydrates, bad for you, legumes and fruits, fiber, omega-3 fatty acid, physical activity. And of course, a very important point is that the same factors that increase diabetes also increase obesity and cardiovascular disease. And there's also interactions between diet and cancer that also affect the other chronic diseases. So if you do prevention, you can, you're able to do several of these. I will not detail this to you, but you've heard about epigenes. The important thing is to look downstream, because if we're going to solve obesity, we will not be able to do it one patient at a time. We have to do it systematically. And you cannot change your genes, but you can always change your diet and physical activity. 
course, everything is forced by the genes, but that does not mean that we can change our fathers and mothers. The other point that, was, that I'd like to make is what was discussed today. The early origins of adult health and disease are actually you are what, you, what happened to you in utero, and your endocrine responses, your insulin responses, is defined early on. So your growth to the metabolic syndrome is either being small and growing fast, or being macrosomic, and in this case, you also have a risk of obesity. But this is the most common pathway for developing countries. The largest epidemic of diabetes now is going on in India. Mexico is close number two. And this is uh, with Pekka at the time who drew this picture showing that it's not only about individuals, you really have to change the environment. So if we're going to educate, we need to have actions in the environment, not only at the individual level. These are some of the actions at the, at the community level. This is introduction of trans-free foods and you can see here that the same companies, in terms of the French fries and chickens, depending on where they're selling, Denmark said we will not take anything that has more than 2%, and there it is. While in other places, Poland, Peru, the Czech Republic, maybe 20 to 30% trans. This is also very important. This is data on tobacco. In 1950, the relative risk of lung cancer was established on tobacco to be 13 to 1. This is 1950. This is sales of tobacco continue to go up. What happened after the first Surgeon General report? Nothing happened. What happened when there was no advertisement allowed? Started to drop. When the non-smokers started to create trouble for their industry. When they increased the tax twice, they increased it by two, and when WHO convention came around, that includes limiting the place where you can smoke. So this is a good example of what needs to be done if we're going to tackle the epidemic of chronic diseases, including cancer. This is my last concept. If you're going to do prevention, you really have to do it at every stage of the life course. You have to be concerned about the exposures of mothers in utero. Endocrine effects that occur in utero have lifelong consequences. Contaminants in breast milk, air. So this is the cumulative risk as it develops but the preventable risk is in fact early on. So this concept is, if we're going to do something about it, we need to do something very early, and maybe we'll do it right, and cancer will be prevented. This is a challenge I leave to you, and I leave to myself and all others. Last slide, targeted prevention, related to both the existing problems, selective high-risk individuals, but the most cost-effective is universal directed at everyone. If we start here, it's not a bad point, but we really need prevention at the university level. Thank you very much for your attention.